My name is Shmuel Gershon, and I have a confession. For a long time, I didn't know how to manage my budget. Now today, thanks to software and applications like Mind.com and CheckMe and things like that, I do know how to manage my budget, because these guys have worried of packaging all the knowledge about budget management into software. They have given, the, they have given this to me. So for me today, the value of Mind.com or their similars is in the knowledge that they give to me. This is the summary of all of that we'll be uh, talking for the next few minutes. And it will be a philosophical journey on what's the real value of software, why we sometimes get it wrong, what is software and what's the value of our practices, and thus the value of ourselves as software professionals and sometimes as human beings. So uh, before we start, I'm Shmuel and I come from Israel. I deal with software and matters that relate people and software during most of the day or night hours. And uh, even though for half my career I was a programmer, for the last years my passion has been in how to test software in a good way. And uh, these are the areas where you start thinking about these philosophical things on what exactly are we doing and wh what will that mean to have tested it in a good way. It's hard to see when you don't have a finished thing that just compiles. How do you understand if what you have done is something that worked and that is okay? So, and so that's where this comes from. The way that we will be uh, talking, we'll be dividing the talk in three parts. We'll talk about the philosophical concept, and from there we'll see how this awareness changes the way we do the different practices that we do day to day in our teams and as individuals. And last, we'll see some simple and short uh, ideas on how we can, in practice, already tomorrow, start changing the way we work and change the talk in a way that fits this new reality that we'll be learning today now. So, Bjorn Sostrup, the father of C++, I believe many of us here owe part of uh, uh, our jobs or the things that we like to him. He, has, uh, he, he said this, and it's not a modern quote that he said. Now, this is a quote from years ago. Our civilization runs on software. And I would like to say that's more than that. Our current civilization is completely dependent on software. Fortunes are built and broken uh, on software. So if you want to be a multi-billionaire today, you either have to uh, get a software company or own a country that has oil. And that second is a harsh market. So, uh, and f from the moment that we uh, date and are born up to during our life, in our happy moments and our sad moments, and up to the time that we are uh, by the end of our lives, we are being surrounded by software all around. It's software, software, software. Municipalities work on software, countries work on software. You attack a software, that, uh, the, the software infrastructure of any country, and you have completely paralyzed it. So the biggest question about this quote and this concept is how come that it happened so fast? 1960s, no one was talking about software apart from three people. Well, I think that the actual word for software just uh, uh, happened uh, later than that. So our grandparents didn't know about software. For some of us, our parents didn't know about software for a lot uh, of their life. So it's in a matter of 50, 60 years, software arrived, started, and completely changed the landscape of our reality. Everything works different because of software. That has, must be one of the fastest revolutions that happened to humankind. And that's the question. So how did it happen like that? Why is software so important? What's the real value of software for human beings? So one of the answers to that question I found in uh, this book by Philip Armour. It's called The Laws of Software Process. It's a fascinating book, even though it has an unfascinating title. It's a very boring title, The Laws of Software Process. I think the only way it could be more boring is if it was the opposite, The Process of Software Law. But the, the book itself is incredible. It's a, and, and what it says there is that software is a new step in the evolution of how human dealt with knowledge over the ages. And this step is a very natural step, and that's why it happens so easy and so fast. The five stages that 
that uh, Philip Armour says that happened, well, like this, th these are the five mediums for knowledge storage and knowledge transfer that humans had. The DNA, the brain, the tools, the books, and now software. We'll go into details of each one of them so we can uh, better understand what's meant by a software medium, software, uh, knowledge medium, and a large knowledge transfer medium. And uh, we'll try to compare them between themselves as in matters of what's, uh, how well they store the knowledge, how well we can control the knowledge that happens in it. So the first one is the DNA. So humans, perhaps before they were called humans, they had this thing to store knowledge. And it's maybe the most essential way to deal with knowledge that we have today. That's the way I, teach, I taught my sons how many fingers they should have, how to breathe, how to metabolize food. Right? The knowledge that makes us alive is all stored into DNA. And it's uh, a very complex, but very from a point of view of how to do it, it's a simple uh, matter of transferring. Each generation transfers the knowledge one to the other. The knowledge evolves and adapts, and it just moves. Uh, so DNA is incredibly persistent. I, I we're talking millions of years of persistence. The tricky thing is that, yet at this point still, we cannot control what knowledge we put into the DNA. We are working on that, but uh, we, we, it's, it's hard to be intentional on what do you want to store in the DNA. It's hard to update the DNA. It's hard to, to change it. The DNA by itself is very weak. It, it doesn't change anything around the person it's stored inside. So DNA has uh, some weaknesses and some strengths. With time, a lot of time, the humanity evolved into a new way of storing knowledge, the brain. I know it looks like a nut, but <laughs> and it's, it was the cleaner way to take a picture of a brain. And uh, it's a nutty brain. Or so the, and the, the brain is where we store information historically. Water is behind the big rock, or the bisons will come in the winter or how to calculate interest rates into the mortgage on my personal budget. So we store this knowledge in our brains, if we know it. So the, we can control exactly what knowledge to put there. That's fantastic. That, that's the main strength of the brain. You, you now have just decided to store in your brain this knowledge, but the brain is a storage of knowledge. The tricky part is that it's not very persistent, so it just dies together with the brain. And, uh, and that makes it uh, very weak. When you have a, a lot of knowledge in one place, but you cannot trust it to be with you for the next generation or so, it makes it uh, lacking a lot of, of its value. So a third stage that the humans get, got into storing knowledge was the tools that we are the tool makers. And many of you are thinking, possibly you, are thinking, oh, but tools are tools. They are not knowledge. They are, they are think, but if, think with me that before humans were able to talk, the way that people learned that a sharp rock opens a coconut better than a round rock was by looking at the first tool that happened to, to, to do that. So the first person that opened the coconut that way was able to transfer the knowledge to the entire tribe and to the animals or to anyone that was observing just by showing the tool or using it. And to this day, if you want to now to discover or to learn knowledge, what's the best way for a children to cut a piece of paper without cutting itself, then we have stored this knowledge into the tool. If you want to know what's the best material and form to cut something as strong as a fingernail, we have this knowledge inside tools. In fact, uh, an interesting anecdote, I have a friend who is an industrial engineer. And uh, when he was studying, one of his research, research was in uh, ketchup bottles. And it turns out there are hundreds of patents for ketchup bottles. Everyone improving on the past one, oh, uh, that's better to squeeze, it has a better opening, it has a better way to fill and to keep out. So everybody is learning and discovers something new that we can do with a bottle, uh, ketchup bottle, and then it puts it into a new tool. So that means years and years of evolution of the knowledge on how to make the perfect hamburger and the perfect hot dog is now stored inside the ketchup bottle that you buy in your supermarket. And the tools, 
even to this day, we are finding ancient tools. They are very intentional and they are very persistent. The problem is that they are hard to update. And, uh, and they don't act by themselves, though they are the closest uh, uh, to the things that we said now that actually act into the world. The fourth stage that humans got was with books and writing. And uh, books are very intentional. In fact, they are extremely intentional. You can write, get into details in your writing on what you mean and what you don't mean. And you, they are persistent. You can pass to each other. Uh, more than that, there is this, uh, another book it's called The Miraculous Birth of Language, where part of the things that he says is, is that the, the act of writing gave us history. We wouldn't have history as we know it today without this history book. Now, I, I brought all these books all the way from, from Israel here. So they're good books if you want to read. There's a, there's a party this evening, and for uh, two-thirds of my life, the way I dealt with parties was by sitting in a corner reading a book. So if, <laughs> if you want to do that, you can take mine for tonight. And the, so books, they, they changed the entire landscape of knowledge because it was the first time that we could store knowledge that is abstract. It's not something that I do. I can store knowledge that is wrong, that I know is wrong, and write on it, this knowledge is wrong, and then pages of it. So this is, not, this is something you couldn't do with anything else. So book has uh, this big revolution. But the problem with books is that they are also weak. They are how to, hard to update, and then by themselves, they just stand in a, in a shelf uh, gathering dust and they don't do anything. And that's how, after years and years of longing for something new, that's how we got to the fifth stage, which is the software. So now we store the knowledge in a bunch of ones and zeros. So if I want to know how to manage a budget, I don't need to learn it. The knowledge is packaged to me without me learning any of the theories of budget management. I know how to find information on the internet, even though I haven't indexed all the web pages around. But if you ask me, do you know how to find information about Aarhus? Well, yes, I know how to find information about Aarhus. Why? Because that information is packaged and it's now inside Ask Jeeves or any other web search that you would like. So that's, that's a way to, to transfer knowledge. And uh, the very interesting thing is that if you start to analyze how software works in base of the same criteria that we talked before, and software is very intentional and very precise. You can go you can, you, with your bits, you do whatever you want. It's easy to update, it's easy to transfer, it's very persistent. And software actually acts on the world on itself. So as we speak now, there are people getting rich and getting poor without them doing anything just by software that is running autonomously. Uh, software are bidding on purchases without anyone connecting to it. Wars are happening all part of the, the wars all by software. So we are giving with time enough interfaces to software for software to act on the world by itself. And that gives it a strength that no, nothing had until now. It's a bit scary. On the other hand, it shows us how valuable software is as a knowledge transfer medium. Because that's what it is. It's a knowledge transfer medium. So when you, we look at it again, we start to understand what's the answer to this, to this question. What, how can it be? that software arrived and revolutionized all the entire civilization as we know it in only a few, a few years. And the answer is that not only the humans were ready for the software when it arrived, because it's part of the natural uh, evolution of humankind, human created the software at the exact same moment that it needed it and was able to use it. So it's not a matter, it's, it's not a big, it's possibly the tools had the same. And uh, if you go back, you know, a few mil uh, millions of years ago and you go to the go to conference back then, people were saying, oh, tools, uh, knowledge uh, uh, medium. And it was surprising everyone back then, just like software is surprising us today. So we can summarize this philosophy into this model. Software is, is not a slash the product that you sell. Software 
is a knowledge transference channel. And, and that's how you have to think about the software that you are producing. In fact, something very interesting that I noticed when I was building this, this slide. I, was, I wanted to make this contrast between a disk that represents the product and knowledge. So I made a collage out of pictures that I took from Google Images on the word knowledge. And if you can see up there, then you see that uh, you don't see the marker. But you see that we have Google Images brings you books, it brings you brains, it brings you gears that are tools. So by now, we have already internalized this concept that books, brains, tools, they are knowledge. You don't have, you don't find a Google Image software, but I, it's very possible that 50 years from now, when I go to 2063, when you look for the word knowledge in Bing Images, you will not only find books and tools, you will also find sets of ones and zeros and software. Because by then, we would have internalized this concept that the software that we are working on is a, is a way to store knowledge and give this knowledge to other people. Now, when we deal with knowledge, it's a tricky thing. Knowledge has many different layers and levels. For once, there is the knowledge uh, that, that this is, if many of the uh, tracks here are talking about this, the knowledge on how you decide uh, how, how, to, how to do the product. So you have to know the domain. So if you are doing mind.com, you have to know what is budget management and how to do budget management. But you also have to understand the technology and now what technology to use and how to use this technology. So, and this is for the things we know. The problem is that many times, and I think I, I find this very, very interesting that suddenly you can see this concept in many talks, and this is not the first talk that is talking about this. You have also different layers and levels of ignorance. And, uh, and uh, Armour, it's actually, the, it, it starts as a different essay, but it was added to the same book. He has these uh, levels of uh, orders of ignorance. So there's the zeroth order of ignorance. That means I don't have any ignorance. I know. So I know a language. For example, I know kanji. That's very uh, clear to work. Or in our world, the knowledge about those mind.com works with iOS. It's easy to deal with knowledge, like the lack of ignorance. There's also the, the first order of ignorance, that is knowing that you don't know something. If you, don't, if you know that you don't know kanji and you need to know kanji, it's easy to deal with that. You get a kanji book and you learn about that. In our software world, that these are the easy questions. Those mind.com works with Android OS. OK, that's an easy question. I, I can find the answer rather, rather fast. But then we get to the second order of ignorance, which is I don't know that I don't know something. And, uh, and that's what happens with us day to day when you got to work, and now you have to figure out, oh, it's, you thought it's go it was supposed to be written like this, but then no, it was supposed to be written in a different way. And you keep trying because it, you weren't sure what exactly you had to do and what exactly are the questions that you needed to ask. Once the questions are clear, then it's easy. Uh, coding is the easy part of our work. Figuring out how and what to code is the, the hard part. And. Uh, there is yet another step, the third level of ignorance, that is not knowing how to find out what you don't know. That's the lack of process. So many of the Agile methodologies, and not only Agile, the other methodologies too for software uh, writing deal with that on ideas and ways that you can figure out uh, how to discover what you need to discover. But, but most of them leave you the managers and the programmers and the testers alone when you have to discover what you still need to learn. That's the, so uh, most of our work is on this second order of ignorance where we don't know what we don't know. And that's hard work. It's hard work because you don't know how to plan it. You don't know what you are looking for yet. So if it's hard work, then we need to keep this in mind. So that was the philosophical part. OK, so it's, we have, let's see if everybody on the same page. Software is a medium for storing and transferring knowledge. And dealing with knowledge is a hard work. It's a hard work. That's why we are called knowledge workers. That's because that, that's what we are being paid for, to deal with knowledge. So with this part closed, let's deal with the 
uh, part that what it changes in our work day to day. Because it is a change. It is an evolution. And as we'll see, we don't have how to stop it. So one of the things that it changes is how we uh, develop and plan our products. So it stops being a marketing question of well, what can we sell. Right? Uh, and it starts being a question of what people want to know. Or even better, if you are able to start so early, what knowledge can we provide to people outside? What knowledge do we have that we can package into software and give? And uh, a simple example is like, I didn't need Google to search the web. I was using Alta Vista, and it, it had everything indexed. And everyone that came and tried to work like Alta Vista wasn't having much success. So everybody knew how to find pages indexed. The, people, the thing that people didn't know, didn't know was how to rank these pages in a relevant way. So that was the knowledge that Google brought into the game. If you want to make a competitor to mine.com, but you just put the same knowledge inside, then you're not a strong competitor. But you need to figure out what other people w w want to do, what other thing people want to know about their budget. And then when you add this, then you have an entirely different way of looking at the product. Because it's not, oh, this is the product to sell. We are gathering here knowledge for everybody else. It also changes your programming practices. You, you stop asking the question, does it work? Because it doesn't matter if it works or not. You start asking your question, have we reached the most faithful representation of knowledge that we can? And once you are looking for that, remember, that's the, the, the aim for knowledge perfection. It doesn't even matter if you if work or not. Sometimes it's working, but you want to make it better. And when it's not working, then th that's what's represented here by the safe with the band-aid. You don't do, or you try not to do, uh, work around as patches. Uh, how do you feel when you have a bug to fix, and you, open a, you, you fix it as a workaround in a different place? It doesn't feel well, because now that you understand that you are dealing with knowledge, it's like writing a book, and in chapter 11, writing the conditions I wrote in chapter 7 do not apply. See chapter 15 footnote. Uh, it, it gets messy. Your knowledge is not organized anymore. And it's hard to work with a knowledge like that. Like, it will also ch change how you test things. You don't ask anymore, have I run all my tests? Now what you're asking is, what else we don't know that we need to discover to put inside the software? And, and that's a very strong question. It happens it's like uh, people who had played strategy games, then you know this, this thing with the map. Where you have a map, it's completely black. You have a very uh, uh, clear objective, find your enemy and win. And you go, you, you start to discover the map, and you open the map. Every place that looks relevant, you try to open it from being black to something else. You don't go into areas that you know they are, uh, you know what's, what's behind that, because you're trying to figure out what new knowledge you need. And that happens the same. You're, the testing process starts being, OK, everything that we already know, it's not r important anymore. It, it's, it's not interesting. I want to discover what else we don't know, things that we didn't discover while we were programming. And it will also change, if you think about software as a knowledge, to also change the dynamics inside your teams. It's not a matter of, I'm done, I've finished my part, because everybody is dealing with knowledge, so everybody wants to know. And the work that someone else is doing is also becomes interesting. Eric uh, Sink uh, has this uh, essay uh, called uh, Read the Code, where he urges uh, programmers to read, the other programmers check in. And because once you get aware of the knowledge that they are putting into their code, you start programming different. You start adding a different type of knowledge. You start using a different style. So once it's a, a matter of knowledge, then it gets, I, I, everybody's interesting to know, OK, well, what are the other bugs that we have around? What, things, what uh, knowledge is missing in our product? And not only inside your team, it will change also how your team works between different teams. Marketing and programmers and code and uh, testers. Uh, it stops being a matter of uh, I manage, you test, you code, to a matter, OK, everybody's trying to figure out uh, knowledge. And 
if, if we look at this drawing, for example, and we can say the work of a programmer, let's divide the, the programming and testing uh, as activity, the activity of, of, of programming is finding something. So it goes with the blue line, and you, you try something, and then you, ah, that's not a good direction. I'll move to a different direction, and then I'll try this library, oh, dead end, throw this away, I'll start from the beginning. So by the end, you have something that is compiles and is executing. You have covered a lot of, info of area of what you wanted to learn, and now it's all inside the software. And then you, you get to this testing activity, when well, the testing activity is just using different tools and different techniques and a different mindset to cover more of the white areas outside, and then you start trying which other knowledge you, you can touch. And the knowledge that is missing, you add it. The knowledge that uh, uh, just confirms it's also knowledge that is important. Everything that is teaching you something new becomes valuable. And it will change significantly the way you do estimates. Because if you look at your program as a, like a list of functions, that's very easy to do. And I'll be done in three weeks. It's, I know how to do a function. If you look at your software as things that you have to learn so you, know, so you can encode this in software and you don't know yet what you need to learn, then it becomes much different. I, just to, to give it a... Uh, so I have here a book by, it's called The Evolution of Useful Things. It's by Henry Petrosky. Uh, Brian Chess mentioned him uh, on, on his keynote. And uh, he has a very interesting part here at the beginning where he speaks about the fallacy of form follows function. I, everybody knows this phrase, and we are, we would like, oh yeah, my software follows the function. I, I written it to perform a very, very defini defined list of things. So when you think about that, then a function is something simple, and you can deal with that. So Petrovsky says that form follows failure. Right? You keep failing until you succeed. And because you cannot plan to fail, otherwise you don't fail, because you cannot plan to fail, then your estimates change. The way you start thinking forward about what you're going to do starts to change too. And uh, in the Mythical Man Month, Fred Brooks, he says, when managing software, plan to throw one away. Right? You, you have to plan your software as if you will do something, throw away, and then start again. And this is from the 1980s. Uh, but do we really do like that? Do we understand that our programming practice is a matter of learning, and that you have, you have to put into your estimates all this time that you will spend failing, which is a funny thing to say to the manager. Oh, how long will it take for this product? Oh, it'll take me four weeks. Why? Because I'll fail, fail twice, and this will take three weeks, and then I'll quickly do it right. So I say, OK, so, so start from the end. Do it right. Well, <laughs> don't waste all these weeks failing at the beginning. <laughs> Bring me another guy who doesn't fail. Right? So, so it's, it's tricky to put that into your estimates. But you have to, if you deal with knowledge, and your manager knows you deal with knowledge, and that's why he's paying a knowledge worker to, then it becomes uh, uh, cl cl clear for everyone. And last, it will change significantly the way you track your progress and the way you see your reports. And uh, because, like we said, you cannot plan to fail, you cannot plan to be creative. There are things that happen as you go against the plan. Right? So every time you have a plan and you have said, yeah, okay, we'll be done on three weeks, and you actually reach that in three weeks, then something is tricky. You just copy paste it for the other product. It, it can't be because <laughs> where's all the failure and where, where's all the learning in this process? So I, I, this this picture for me has this example. It's a fantastic thing. Uh, Pedro Alvarez Cabral was a explorer in Portugal. That's point A in the Google map there. And uh, his chart was to go and discover a better path to the Indias, and then Portugal will be rich, because we will find a good way to go to the Indias. And that's how, what he was trying to do. He was circulating the, the Africa with his ships. But he ended up, oops, uh, getting to Brazil and discovering Brazil. Right? Uh, sorry. And uh, the story, some of the uh, explanations to that is that he saw birds migrating to that side. And he figured out, oh, if birds are going there, there should be some land. Let's see what's happening there. And then, OK, he got to Brazil. Portugal colonized the largest part of uh, South America and got incredibly rich, and it was a great day. But up to that point, if we start to think about what, how the stand-up meetings at the court of Queen Isabel looked like, 
And she was asking, OK, and how's that Cabral guy doing? Oh, I don't know, he's following birds. And she was raging mad and saying, oh, fire that guy. How come I sent him to the India to make us rich? How come, why is he looking for something else? And he was just red, 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 red every week until he found something much better than the Indians. And the, the way we work is the same. And it, I have to tell that it's something that actually happens at work. I work in a testing department uh, for Intel. And, uh, when a team is consistently being green in all his processes, in all his progress reports, we look inside. There may be something wrong. Where are all the bugs? The, the bugs that you find stop you from progressing. Right? So if you're not, if you're in, in all knowledge acquisition activities that we have, if you are getting to the in time, then it's, it's a, that's an alert signal. Maybe someone is not learning, and they have to see if you're just not learning, then you are just copying the other product that you made. So that's the change thing. Notice that this change, I'm not urging uh, us to change. I'm just saying, OK, this change will happen, right? because, because that's, that's the nat nature of software. And uh, it's funny, after I had drawn these slides, I uh, found a book, I was perusing a book called the Tales for Coaching. And there was a short story there that says there are two caterpillars eating in a cabbage uh, leaf. And they're then yum, 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 eating. And suddenly they, they hear a flopping uh, up there, and they look up, uh, to the sky, and they see the caterpillar from the neighboring cabbage is flying with his beautiful and colorful wings. And then one caterpillar turns to the other and says, you'll never catch me up on one of those things. And many times we can think the same. We can say, oh, well, that's a big change. That's a philosophy knowledge. I'm not entering into that. We may not have an option. It's either adapting before it forces us and then being able to work with it in a good way or just being hit over and over. That's, that's the, the, the nature of, of, of the evolution. It just happens. It will force its way in. So this summarizes some of the points that thinking about software as a knowledge medium will change in our work. Not all, but these are some of the points that I see it changing in my day to day. And uh, in the next part, We'll, we'll suggest some ideas on simple things that we can start working on that will change our uh, way of thinking in a way that will fit this new reality. So the first is to understand that change comes with within, from within. So you are all starting to do great on that aspect from now, because you are at this talk, and you are listening to the, to the ideas, and you are being, starting to be aware that this change is needed. And so it's, it, this is a personal matter inside yourself. It is a theme matter, so it's inside your team. It's a department matter, so, but it, it, it should happen from inside to outside, because it's, it's not a new process that you want to bring, and then tomorrow you, you print a big chart and say, OK, this is the new process. You, you keep your same process, but you do the exact same steps in a completely different way, because you will be having a completely different uh, mood and a completely different point of view. So that's, so that's the first thing, being aware that this change uh, needs to happen, and it depends on you. The second thing is working on, on a problem that you care. So it can be like this, scratching a personal itch, like Eric Raymond said. He said he has this essay about the uh, how all these fantastic GNU tools came about and the difference between them. And it says, a good uh, software scratches a personal itch of the programmer. And you have, because you have a problem to solve, and it's your problem. So you start to care a lot about how good and how elegant is the knowledge inside it. You don't compromise for its working. You want perfect, because it's your problem. I, uh, I see it. In a very clear in, in the tools that I provide. I thought that I, I provide tools that for, for testing. And the ones that were created for me slash my team, 
they are much more successful like, in, a, in a broadened con context than in the general public than something that I thought, oh, this will be great for everyone. Uh, <laughs> no one could, could care less about this. But the ones that where I am scratching my own problem, my own itch, these, they are uh, written with care. And, uh, and the knowledge on it is valuable. Now, it's not always easy for a company to solve its own problems, because many companies are there writing software to solve someone else's problem. And the closest that we can get to it is by dog fooding. And uh, dog fooding is the practice of using your own software in your company. And it's, uh, it's, it's a rather simple, uh, not, not always it's possible, but you can always do something uh, to get close to that. It's, it's a very simple technique, and, but that is very, very powerful. And uh, it's interesting that we, we skip over it all the time, and we think we are done. Yeah, we are done. No one even tried to see if it's really if the software is useful. Uh, we have our definition of done is a uh, yeah, it's, it compiles and it runs the test. Sometimes it's automated. That's that's done. And I think the definition of done means we are now using it inside. If we are able to use it inside, th then w th that's when we're done. Uh, if no one is using it within ourselves, can, can we really say that that's done? Is our definition of done as good? So dog fooding will bring you closer to the problem. And once you are closer to the problem, you care about the quality of the knowledge you put inside. You will not compromise for working. Another matter is uh, thinking about the user. And now you are all thinking, oh yeah, well, that part I cover. I think about the user. But do we really? So it's, uh, Enrico Fermi is told to have been sitting at lunch musing about the existence of life outside the Earth, and he got to the conclusion that oh, in a statistical uh, probabilistical matter, if there is life uh, outside the planet Earth, uh, the, uh, some of this life should be much more evolved than, uh, than us. And then by now, we would have seen them, or they would have made contact. And then he got up from his chair and screamed, if so, then where is everybody? And that's the same question we ask now. So we like to talk about users. Oh, we even start things like, as a user, I went to which user? I don't know, any, all of them. <laughs> but the user is not with us when we're talking about the user. There's a very simple technique that it's, it's often overlooked because it's simple, okay? especially big companies don't like simple solutions, uh, called personas, where uh, you take, uh, it's not user profiling, it's a persona. You take a profile of user and you make it detailed with names uh, as a person that you start to like or dislike, it's, it's a living fictional being that is there that you can start to decide, okay, this function is for Andre, that function is for Maria, and, uh, or uh, this bug will bother uh, Robert, or things like that. And uh, then the knowledge starts to be personal. You start to understand what knowledge people want to learn from you. Are you providing the knowledge that people really want? Because no one wants functions. People want to know th how to do things they weren't able to do until now. So using a technique like personas will bring this, it will transform your uh, use case, use stories. Uh, as a user, uh, we have a lot of things that start with the word user, user-centered design. But the user is not really there, not even a functional one like a persona. So having this will make you uh, much more closer to, to having valuable knowledge inside. Another one is changing the vernacular. Now, vernacular is a fancy word for fancy words. <laughs> That's more or less what it means. That's the, the words that you use as your common uh, phrase. Like, uh, and so changing the words that you use in your day-to-day -day, uh, don't need to be fancy. Just using the word knowledge more changes uh, this word completely. So I, I uh, can remind, remember a, an example where uh, we had a, a bug. We were looking at a bug where we had a, a product that connects over the network, so it has a lot of network protocols. And one of the we discovered uh, one application, very exotic, uh, small one, that was setting a different flag in the protocol, and we were, weren't dealing with this flag. And uh, we were discussing this bug. And the bug was all around functionality. And more or less the questions were, is that application important enough for us to deal with this bug? Until we started to change how we talk. And we twisted that question into, should our product know how to deal with this flag in the protocol? 
And that's a completely different question. And, and, and if on the previous question, we were almost not fixing the bug, now that you are talking about knowledge, and everybody wants the knowledge to be perfect and to be complete, then the decision turned in a completely different way. So, and, and this is, uh, it's really, it, it's just a matter of, without being an annoying, because sometimes you learn a new word and you get annoying at work, but without being annoying, it's just a matter of from time to time when you're speaking about a new design and you're speaking about uh, a bug to fix or, or, or what feature we should leave out of the product, then using the word knowledge and saying, okay, is this, do our software need to know this? Does our, our software know this well enough? And that changes the way people look at it. Because knowledge is abstract and knowledge is, is important. Like, knowledge that is missing, no one likes that. Very similar to that is getting scribes everywhere. Right? So having documentation of this knowledge. The best way that you can document the knowledge is who answers? Three, two, one. In software, right. right? So, so for example, that's how we do it. So I remember. So years ago, so when we do a build of a release, then there's someone, that, the guy, that knows where to take the files and build it, and then he puts, and then he zips everything, and then he releases. Now we have put all this knowledge into software, and we have the build management systems. Right? Uh, installing a driver is terribly complicated. You have to change the registry, and then you have to put the file in the right place. So one way to install a driver is to give knowledge in, in a paper. Okay. Copy this file to the system drivers folder, change the registry, or we can make a wizard where you press next, 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 and all this knowledge is now inside your, your, your software. And all these uh, nice and, and useful scripts that move between people at work, this is all knowledge. Oh, this guy knew how to do that. He put that on script. Now it's on software, and everybody's using that. So the best way is to put it on software. Uh, but also knowledge that is written is helpful, and sometimes you have some sort of mix of that uh, when you have things like Doxygen, where you are writing your code and your comments, and Doxygen makes expose all the knowledge that is out of the code, or everything that you put in the comments is now exposed to everyone to see and to learn. Or in testing tools, things like Fitness, which is a test management tool that is uh, incorporated with a wiki, so the idea is that every test comes with the story of why the test is written and, and with the proposal and why. And uh, for people who are, uh, uh, ha have seen the essays on uh, literate programming, no, I'm kidding, I don't have that book, literate programming from uh, Donald Knath, I think we have a certain in this conference that Knath is, uh, is awesome. So he has these essays called literate programming on how do you write a program where your, your representation of knowledge in English takes priority and precedence over the code, and the code is just simple to write because all the knowledge is already known. So that's getting scribes, so taking care that this knowledge is, is stored somewhere, not only the brains. Remember that brains are not persistent. And, and last, to let the and justify the means when you're working, but you have to keep the right end in mind. And the end is not, let's release this. No, that's not the right end. The end is, let's achieve the most faithful representation of the useful knowledge our users want. Right? That's a very, very long end, but, but that's the right end to keep in mind, especially if you want to justify means. Otherwise, just get uh, ugly. And this summarizes, and these are only a few of the many things you can do to start uh, working in a way that you receive the software uh, revolution in a good way, and you make the software you produce be in the front when, uh, as a matter of software that is knowledge. So we saw these, uh, these three parts. Now, one of the things is that I, I think this outlook is, is fascinating. If you look at the evolution that we have been uh, done, especially on testing, right? uh, uh, part now as, as from my current passion of testing, if you see uh, well, the first knowledge medium of DNA, that that's easy. Right? Pass means you're alive, and fail means you're dead. That does <laughs> simple test to do. But as we evolved from test to brains, uh, when we started to ask questions, and uh, the brains meant 
um, this is the last one, thank you. And brain meant that we started to argue, and now we started to have interesting discussions that's testing the other no people's knowledge in the brain for tools, or actually trying things out, and to books, in all the editing and discussions that they brought. But suddenly, when we got to software, now the way that we can test it got uh, so much uh, exciting. And uh, I'm not sure which will be the sixth uh, stage in the human knowledge transfer medium evolution. But uh, I'm certain it will be great to program, and I'm certain I want to be a tester on it. So that summarizes the, uh, the talk that I had. And uh, you can ask questions if you want. I will reply by software. <laughs> no <I'm> kidding. <laughs> by encapsulating knowledge and software, don't we risk hiding it instead of spreading it? Open source your code. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's a good solution, actually. Now you, you get the best of four worlds. People can read the code and kind of. Uh, I think so. I think that it actually makes it uh, accessible. Um, if you want to. Uh, whoa, whoa, this Shmuel is saying intriguing slash stupid things. I, will, I want to research about him after the talk. Then you know how to find information about me. If, if all this knowledge was to be put out. In, in extents for you, instead of hiding it in the Google code servers, it will be uh, unreach it will be actually unreachable. So putting it into code because it's it's a knowledge that executes that, that maybe the only uh, well, tools to execute as well, but that's a, a knowledge that, that executes by itself, makes it reachable for everyone. I think uh, that's now I know how to call my uh, grandmother in Venezuela. Because someone put it, a lot of software for me, so it's so, so the, all this knowledge is now made reachable just because it's in there. Uh, so it's it's not hiding. You're true. You're right that it's encapsulating it, but that that shouldn't be uh, uh, something against it. I think. Thank you.